So, uh, welcome to this giant throng gathered here today. God, that pisses me off. But live the joke, Vince. I'd say live the joke. So we're going to talk about VR and AR and MR uh, and its association with news and non-scripted content. So um, this is the first panel that I've ever done in these some 40 odd years that I've done these panels where I've never done with anyone on this panel, ever even, I've only met Michael, so, so I don't have a clue where this conversation's gonna go, but it's gonna be about VR, and we don't need to ask people whether they know what VR is, because I'm sure they already do. So uh, joining us is Jason Farkas, who uh, runs uh, VR for CNN, so has a lot of uh, things to tell us about how that news organization is using VR and AR and, uh, and whatever new methods that are out there, what's coming down the pike, and where are we going with it. Uh, and next to him is Patrick Megan, who uh, is a VR filmmaker with Jaunt, and I think it was just last week, you won an Emmy Award for a really incredible, uh, I want to say documentary in VR. It's kind of a documentary, but we can talk about that in a minute, called uh, Collisions. Um, you, you really want to see it, you can go to Jaunt and get it uh, and, and, uh, and look at it. It's fascinating. We'll talk about what that is. Next to him is Michael Santiago. Uh, and Michael is with LaDuma. Thank, thank you, LaDuma, for sponsoring the panel, giving us the Google Cardboards, which we'll talk a little bit about in a minute. Uh, Michael is a business development executive there and has the unenviable task of trying to sell VR out. Uh, and uh, Michael Dutton has kind of that same unenviable task. Uh, and he is a, a senior vice president with Mesmerize that are located in London. and. Uh, here in the United States, and one of the founding members of Mesmerize, a friend of mine uh, who was the head of digital at uh, Sky News, uh, Andrew Hawken. And so there's a, sort of in the bones of the company, there's journalism, and there's non-scripted. And then uh, joining us at the uh, very end of the panel, but absolutely not the end of the conversation, is Erica Barraza. Uh, Barraza. Uh, Erica is a, a VR entrepreneur. Uh, and has uh, an interesting new venture, which is sort of off the point of uh, news and VR and exactly on point. So when we get down to the conversation, uh, we'll, we'll talk about why I think that's kind of a little bit of a, uh, a quasi sort of two sides of the coin business that you've got happening there. But Jason, tell me a little bit about what CNN does in VR and what you're planning on doing with it and how it's being accepted. Sure. Um, for the last two years, we, we really wanted to make 360 video um, a core competency throughout our whole organization. We, uh, we really feel like we need to produce virtual reality at the speed of news, which two, two, two and a half years ago wasn't possible. The technology wasn't there. Uh, it was too expensive. It took too long to uh, process the footage and to stitch. Um, but in that time, the technology has come such a far away that we now have 15 bureaus around the world um, which is about a third of our total bureaus, by the way, but 15 bureaus around the world um, that are equipped with 360 video hardware that have producers that are dedicated to uh, virtual reality content creation. And uh, we really believe that this format, that 360 video and, and VR as an offshoot um, or vice versa, is probably the most intense uh, medium that you can express a, a journalistic story in. And so as soon as, it, um, as soon as it sort of came on the scene, we, we pivoted towards making VR uh, part of the core mission of CNN and covering breaking news um, in that experience. Because when, when you're watching uh, people struggle uh, in the middle of a hurricane or watching a riot take place at the Republican National Convention or in Charlotte or what have you, um, there's a sense that you cannot actually experience that through a fixed frame of video, whether you're watching it on your phone or your TV, to experience it, you really need 360. And uh, we saw that power immediately, and so we've built our organization kind of around producing this in the same way that we produce digital content and television content. Great. Um, I, I have questions about the ethics of VR journalism, but I don't, wanna, I don't wanna have that happen right now. So everybody that's sitting out there, there's a pair of uh, LaDuma branded uh, Google Cardboard. Um, if you go to the, uh, the um, not the App Store, uh, Google Play right now, you can download the uh, VR journalism app. On the VR journalism app is content from people on the panel, 
uh, and I don't have the uh, URL uh, for Jaunt. We, we can talk about that in a minute when we, when we talk to Patrick about it. And I want you to see collisions. Uh, it's a fascinating story. Uh, and why don't you tell us a little bit about that, Patrick? Yeah, sure. So uh, we actually shot collisions almost two years ago now, uh, working with director Lynette Walworth and uh, independent producer Nicole Noonan. And um, it's the story of an Aboriginal elder in uh, the outback of Australia, and basically the story of his first encounter with Western civilization, which turned out to be an atomic bomb test uh, by the British military. And so from his perspective, um, this was, he was witnessing the manifestation of a god, and it was really about kind of the story takes you through sort of the thought process and the evolution of his experience um, as this god turns out to not be uh, providing for him, but actually uh, destroying some of the people around him. And his, and so the, the, the title collisions kind of comes from this collision of a very traditional uh, culture uh, clashing and colliding with Western civilization in this way. Um, and part of the interesting aspect of working with the Aboriginal people is this idea that Aboriginal people view the landscape in a very kind of almost 360 way. They have an incredible sense of the space. They, you know, have this particular man, Neary, had traversed the entire continent on foot at least two or three times throughout his life. Um, so they have an incredible spatial awareness. And uh, when we actually brought our camera there, which at the time was sort of a prototype camera with 16 GoPros, um, he immediately sort of understood what we were doing. And I think that was sort of the, in a way, Lynette, the artist, had known of his story for a long time, but felt that it wasn't until this v the, the VR medium started to come around that, uh, it would, that this would be the appropriate way to tell this story. Um, and it's and basically what we do is we travel you give you you know the the subjectivity of the piece really evolves traveling you know you as a passenger traveling to this community uh, you encountering Neri and eventually you are actually put into his actual point of view as we have an animated sequence that recreates the uh, bombing um, and we also kind of just discuss uh, the kind of connection with the land that the Madu people or the Aboriginal people have and sort of the way they use fire to uh, to control the land. Uh, it was a, a, it's a fascinating study and absolutely something you definitely want to uh, go and grab and look at, use the go cardboard, listen to it with headphones, because one of the things that struck me right in the first time I saw it was the r incredible use of spatial sound. Mm -hmm. It sounded like it was spatial sound. I'm not sure that it, if, it, if yeah. it was, you were at the leading edge of the technology there, because, you know, things would happen and you'd hear Neary's voice and you'd wonder where it was coming from. You'd turn around to find him. Uh, there was another sequence in there, you talk about the bombing, uh, the, the bombing being the explosion of the atomic bomb, and how the people felt that the, as the kangaroos fell over because of the blast that God was bringing them something great, and they could go and grab the ca kangaroos and then have them for dinner, and boom, you know, you know the end of that story. Anyway, uh, we'll talk about that because I think there's also some ethical issues in there. So we've talked a little bit about news coverage, we've talked a little bit about not necessarily news coverage, but it's almost documentary filmmaking mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in VR. So Michael Santiago uh, from uh, our host LaDuma um, has uh, an interesting uh, perspective from the business development perspective, but, but also taking a look at VR as your company shifted from being something primarily sports oriented to something that isn't necessarily primarily sports oriented anymore. So you're navigating this uh, landscape in a, in a different way. Tell us a little bit about that, that journey. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, what's interesting about when we talk about virtual reality or augmented reality, MR, that kind of stuff, it, it truly is at its core uh, an art form. It's, it's, it's designed by creative people. And, um, and now taking that to sometimes industries that aren't inherently creative is sometimes a difficult uh, task. And so we learned very early on that working with sports organizations um, could be difficult sometimes because their vision of what they wanted to create, the world they wanted to create, or what they wanted to show, the story they wanted to tell was, was a little bit different than what, how you would film in, in 360 video. Um, and uh, sometimes they would want something that we would maybe view as unauthentic. 
um, where that's one power of virtual reality is creating such an authentic visual experience with, with the medium and with the subject matter. So uh, we, we've definitely had to migrate our, our path and, and who we've worked with in part because we have a creative, a creative team that is passionate about what they do and um, we've found that from a B2B standpoint, if you're taking a very creative kind of art form and then trying to find businesses uh, and ways that they can you know, see value in it, uh, you sometimes have to morph and be uh, nimble in how you um, strategically go after those markets. And so we've, we've gone from sports to filming heart surgeries and, and creating um, experiences for you know, hospitals and medical device companies and um, do, doing travel content. Um, so there's, you know, we, we've definitely migrated in our, our approach um, and have done our best to kind of find the best industries who can kind of collaborate with our vision so that we um, have a sense of authenticity to the creative approach that, that we believe in while still trying to give a business case for it. So a uh, conversation to be had after we've gotten through everybody and a couple of setup questions to be had about uh, how do you go about selling a, pro a VR project? Of what is the best sort of uh, approach? What what is it? What makes a good client for VR? Obviously, again, we're talking about news journalism, non-scripted. So uh, Michael Dutton, uh, who uh, comes from uh, Mesmerized, which has a decidedly journalistic bent, at least at the beginning of the company. Where do you fit in this uh, picture uh, with uh, with Mesmerized being a buy in London and here? In um, well, with respect to location, I mean, we're not, I mean, this is a global universe that we live in now. So um, whether we work with folks in the States or in the UK, China, what have you, not, not so much, not so important. We've got people sort of based all over the world for that. Um, but our focus, I guess, is twofold. One is content creation, uh, and two is platform development. So we're seeing a lot of you know, need um, on the publishing and distribution side to have an infrastructure in place for serving it, managing it, piping it full of interactivity and all of that good stuff. So um, there's a lot of effort there, but, but to get out there, you gotta make it, you gotta tell stories. And so we all, as you said earlier, we, we are, you know, storytellers at the core. We all come from a news background. Um, you got AP, BBC, Sky News at, at the founding level. Um, we are definitely um, trying to use this technology in a way to enhance the overall coverage planning that these news organizations might be uh, putting out there. Um, but we're playing the small game with the big companies rather than a big game with everybody. We want to move forward on what's practical and pragmatic, so not overthinking the technology, not taking gear into the field that might be too big for the situation. Um, but really come away with, with content that is compelling at the story level. Um, and then using the, the 360 sort of spherical image as uh, a, new, a new medium. Um, so, you know, we're, we're being tactical as we can because we're a small organization. Um, and, and again, just leveraging the storytelling aspect and background that we have. Do you find that, um agencies and large companies feel this sort of they're compelled to have to drop into VR more than they are compelled to be innovators and leaders in the VR space. So they have to go out and they have to bring people in to make it work for them. Unlike CNN, which has its own department, uh, uh, I don't see that everywhere. Do you? Well, when we got, we've been around for just over a year. And when we set out to find partnerships to, you know, kind of uh, develop, we looked right at the companies that already had a repository for this kind of content. So immediately you've got a Life VR app, you've got a Virtually There app at Gannett, you've got a handful of companies that might not have big you know, video um, infrastructure and operations, more text-based, more video, more visual, uh, photo-based. They need, they need a, a team, so we, we went there. Um, and we kind of came in and sort of said, look, this our, the way we're gonna get this thing done is um, you know not going to be the biggest, highest price tag project in the world, but it's going to leverage an existing operation and enhance your your um, overall content strategy 
without breaking the bank. So, uh, Michael Dutton, I want you to meet Erica Barraza right there, who is actually doing something in exactly that space uh, and uh, trying to bring something new to it. Uh, so, uh, 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 tell us a little bit about your company and what it is that you're doing that dovetails with uh, what we're talking about for news and un unscripted content. Yeah, absolutely. So again, my name is Erica Baraz. I'm the founder of Emerging Visual Realities. It's a marketplace for buying, selling, and licensing uh, virtual reality and augmented digital assets. Um, so as you mentioned, you're, you're trying to create VR experiences at the speed of news. And we're leveraging user-generated content of virtual reality, eyewitness news accounts, and things, um, getting it up onto the platform as fast as possible. We're verifying uh, by integration of blockchain technologies, tracking metadata for any changes in the, in the visual images as well as user accounts, and really leveraging the power of, of the crowd and the fact that the moving trend now is to be leveraging media content with user-generated content and some of the challenges that come with that. So really pulling in uh, you know, radical accessibility to virtual reality content creation and observation. We're building out our platform in web VR, so no one is locked out by needing to download an application. You can view things directly on the web browser. So um, let's, let me ask uh, each of you to give me a definition of uh, the use of VR in uh, news and non-scripted. So if somebody were to come to you, uh, how would you describe that to them? Um, you know, our, our group, we call it CNN VR, but we really see ourselves as um, an immersive storytelling unit because the definition is so spongy, right? Like virtual reality means, okay, I'm obscured in a headset and I have interactivity in a virtual space. AR is digital elements in the real world. MR is kind of the same thing. 360 video is not that, but it's also immersive. So, you know, it's so hard. I think that these terms are sort of bleeding and falling into each other all the time. We, we actually were a little bit nervous about calling it CNN VR because we're like, we're going to have to change this in like a year, you know? It's not going to it's not going to be called that anymore, so. Yeah, except, you know, we still call it TV. We do still call it, right, exactly. We still call it. And, and at the end of the day, this a lot of this is also just like video of different types. But, um, you know, you know to get back, getting back to your question, like what, what, what is the, are you asking like what is the use case effectively of, of this? Just give me a definition of VR news. Uh, VR news um, for us, for us, I'm not saying for everybody on this panel, is um, any uh, storytelling experience that is in 360. So that it involves um, an element of um, you are the director as the viewer. You, um, you have agency as to where you are looking and what you are experiencing um, uh, versus something that is being fed to you as a single line cut. And that's how we differentiate VR journalism from all the other forms of journalism that we do. Well, unless unless it's unless you're covering an event live, we've well we've done 360 live, so that works as well. Right. How would you describe it? How would you define it? Um, well, I, I agree with the kind of blanket term of the you know immersive storytelling. I think it's it's useful to wrap these things together because they're all technologies that feed one another. But um, I think you know for me it's uh, VR is a first-person medium at its core, and so what you're doing is empowering the subjectivity of the audience. Um, that being said, you're, you know, often in historically as production, you know, having done this for you know over three years, production was, is very difficult. So uh, even when we're doing documentaries, I will often describe partner to partners that this is going to be more scripted than they might be used to um, because since you're, you know, people will say, oh, you've removed the frame, but really you've just expanded the frame and you're still composing, you're still, you know, you still have to be, I think, ethical and art artistic about how you compose for this uh, spherical or, or even beyond that infinite frame. Um, but at its core, I would say that you are creating a highly subjective experience or empowering the subjectivity of the audience to put them in a place and or encounter uh, a person or people. So I'm going to stick with the two of you for a second. Uh, don't worry, you guys, I'll, I'll get to you in a minute. Um, but I would imagine that in the newsroom, uh, that both of you are constantly in, in a newsroom or around the newsroom. I know how it's set up in New York. Um, uh, and that there would have been some conversation 
about the ethics of VR and journalism. So what are the big challenges that come up in those conversations? Jason. Yeah, this is, it's interesting. I actually think that, we, I get asked this all the time about how, you know, you, you see everything, right? And you're capturing everybody. So how does that change your approach? But at the, at the end of the day, you're still dealing with um, almost the same exact ethical issues as you would with traditional video and news gathering. Um, we record all kinds of um, upsetting, sometimes, uh, you know, gory, for lack of a better word, um, explicit content that happens in, in breaking news situations or, or otherwise. And we have incredibly strict standards and practices that guide what we will show and why we will show it and what is the reason for showing something that is potentially offensive or extreme or upsetting. Do, is there a good journalistic reason for that? And all of the same questions and rules, guidelines, really exist for 360 video as well. I think where it gets different um, where, where, where it changes course a little bit is that if someone is watching something that you've produced in a headset, they can't, um, it's hard, harder for them to look away from it. They can, of course, close their eyes, but it, it all, it, there's that element. And then there's also the, um, that feeling that you were there, that experience of, of, of being very close in proximity and sometimes losing your sense that you're actually not there. Um, that can be something to, to think about. So um, I'm curious um, about uh, the ratings. Can you look at the kinds of VR content that you're distributing, whether it's a live event, whether it's a documentary type event, or whether it's a news story or a piece that's been produced specifically, voiceover, uh, stand up at the end, video in the middle, and so on, graphics designed. Um, is any one of those areas showing a, a spike in viewership? Uh, for 360? Yeah. Uh, it, well, first of all, it, that depends totally on the platform as well. Um, you know, for, we, we expect to get um, anywhere from a million to five million views on any particular piece of content that we distribute on Facebook 360. Mm. Um, now, CNN has, I think we've got like 40 million or 50 million Facebook followers on the main account. So, you know, it's not, that's not an insane number when you have that many followers. That's oh, still a powerful number. We're the number, you know, we're the number one social news source in the world. So that, it's, it makes it sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy to get a million views. Um, on our own platform, um, we aim to get somewhere between two and 500,000. Um, but there are other platforms like headsets where, you know, 10,000 in a Samsung Gear VR or 20,000, that's like a home run. And so we're like, wow, a lot of people watch this in the most immersive way that they could experience it. And for us, that actually has more sort of value to me in a way that um, we gave someone the full experience. We give 20,000 people the full experience rather than someone sort of maybe seeing it in their Facebook feed for five seconds. Well, then of course, the fact that it lives on, uh, as does content on the internet, gives you the opportunity to go back and look at it a second or a third time and see things that you hadn't seen before because it's VR, because I'm looking this way at when, uh, and then I'm, you know, I look at it a second time, now I'm looking over there, I may be focusing on something different. One last question on this area and then we'll, we'll carry on. In uh, collisions, um, well, I, we, I jokingly said you, you didn't actually have footage of the kangaroos falling over when the bomb went off. You had to create that. So now you've moved VR coverage or a documentary uh, thought process, and you've added graphics into it that are a representation of something that happened back in the 50s. Opens up other questions about the use of recreations and whether or not you do or don't agree with the use of a recreation uh, in journalism. Does that set up any questions for you uh, ethically, or is that just the way it's got to be because of the nature of the beast? Well, I think um, from the documentary standpoint, uh, where you do, you, you know, you're shooting over a number of days and putting a piece together, um, it's, I feel that it's very important to have your subject as a collaborator so that you are, you know, having a discussion of what you're capturing with your subject as you're doing it, um, if you want to portray their story. So it's, you know, I think inevitably there's there is a conceit in VR that it's there's an inherent honesty to it because the camera sees everything, so you can't hide. And you know, but in fact, where you place the camera can hide all sorts of things. Or you know, there's plenty of ways. You know, in collisions, it's not just the animated sequences. We do compositing throughout 
you know, we've removed the tripod in every single shot. We removed myself in many shots, or we've added skies, you know, so time lapse that, skies that, and into and shots. All of those things are um, essentially manipulating the imagery. Correct, um, but I don't. By think, the way, I'm not taking a side on this. Oh, I'm just no, no, no. throwing out. But I think it's in the service of the story that we're focusing on Neri, the subject's story and his point of view, and in dialogue with him, we're trying to recreate his his subjective experience. But you find this to be a pretty similar a across a lot of the projects that you're doing. Yes, no. Um, I think yes. I think it's a matter of how much time you have to work with or, and collaborate with the subject. You know, I think in in other ways, uh, like I had done another project in the Amazon rainforest, and there we had less time. I think what the danger is is that you roll in, you put down a camera, you know, and unlike operating a camera where it's the you know the documentarian or news person's frame that's sort of guiding you're just kind of letting it all speak for itself. Um, and, and again, kind of portraying that this is just pure truth because uh, you can't hide. But I think um, given whatever time constraints you have, I think you kind of limit your, maybe the, the level of uh, opinionated statement you're trying to make. You know, we're making a real statement in collisions uh, and obviously siding with sort of the, the subject's point of view. Um, I think the less time you have, the less of a relationship you have with your subject, um, I, I think you just need to kind of temper the expectations of, uh, you know, of opinion in that piece. <coughs> Trump. Uh, the, um, uh, the idea, and I, I just throw this out there because it's spoken about in a lot of classes, that, uh, that you simply have put a camera there automatically changes what it is you're going to record on that camera just because the camera's there. Not that that's right, wrong, or in between, it's just a fact. So, uh, Michael, talk to me a little bit about, let's move, move into the business area now. Uh, because nobody sees VR unless somebody pays for it. And it, I don't think that, um, that, correct me if I'm wrong, that the business has reached a saturation point yet where it is looked at as a huge business right now. But everybody, obviously, I've, I've read Pew reports, I've read all sorts of, of documentation that shows that the number is increasing uh, in purchase of headsets. Of course, we've got the new, the new headset that just came out, I guess it was the day before yesterday, the new Oculus headset, which doesn't require a cable, doesn't require a phone, so it's a whole new uh, paradigm. Things are changing in the business. Um, but it hasn't reached that sales point where everybody's got to have it. Um, yet everybody's got to have it. Is that what you're finding out there? Yeah, I mean, when we, when we were starting out a couple years ago and just focused on 360 video, um, the first thing you'd hear from anybody that we would talk to or meet with from a business standpoint would be, well, I don't have a headset, nor do my customers who I want to see this. And so um, you had to be strategic in, how you, in your approach and focus on not only the creative and creating this experience that, that would fulfill specific business objectives, whether it be marketing objectives or revenue objectives, um, but then be smart in the sense of deploying the technology for the client. So at the very beginning, we would then take, say, headsets to an event or you know, to um, a medical conference for surgeons to put on for a surgery that we filmed. And so we're now taking that technology there. And I think as Oculus and um, Facebook, Google, um, as a lot of companies, HB, Dell, get involved in the manufacturing of headsets and those become much more available um, on, a, on a grander scale, um, that won't be as much of an issue and that won't be something that we hear as much. Um, but still, you know, for me at least, my own experience is, is that um, being able to come at, um, you know, being able to mix that creative, artistic view of using these platforms, whether it be virtual or augmented reality to solve business objectives, being able to mix that business kind of case, rather than just saying, this is something new, you have to use this, this is what your competitors are doing, everybody loves VR, and more showing how VR is going to solve a very specific objective that they have. And so a lot of it is listening and, and not being a, a kind of a loud, obnoxious salesman who talks too much about how great VR is, but more listening and hearing where you know, VR and AR could, could solve these issues. And if you could do that, um, I think that's where people's 
you know, checkbooks open up, so to speak, and they'll go, okay, I can put money behind this. So, um, M uh, Michael Dutton, before I ask you the question that's like burning right here in my, my chest, I want to ask you if you want to add something to what Mike Santiago just said. Yeah, so I, we all started getting into this VR space, 360 space, about the same time. Three years ago, when I went into meetings and I would talk about this, people would say to me, do I have to wear the headset? They're like, do I have to wear that thing? You know, as, as it was not something they were into. I mean, they didn't know anything about anything. And there's still a lot of people that just don't. I mean, when you get out into the, the world of media, we're still in the fringe. I mean, it's less fringy, but it's still fringe-ish. Um, so getting the point across, getting people to understand, okay, headset works. Well, now we're three years later, Samsung's putting commercials on primetime TV. It's there. We get it. Um, but the distribution and the eyeballs and the money is, you know, still on just the tradition, you know, Facebook, YouTube, that's where people go. So to, to, to uh, Jason's point, it's like you can get six million views on Facebook and, and whatnot, and, and that's great, but, you know, 10,000 views in the headset, that's a home run. So that, that basically tells you the whole story. Um, so our job is to figure out how to teach the people that we're getting to distribute the content, what it is and how it works and how much it costs, and how to get them to teach their audiences how to use it and how to experience it and why it means something to them. What can they get out of it? So it, when it comes to the rubber hitting the road for, from our perspective, you know, there's a, the money comes ultimately from an advertiser. They're gonna pay for it, that's gonna pay for the production of something and so on. The advertiser is only going to get involved if they know that the audiences is the, are there, right? So there's the there's a understanding what they can experiment with versus what's a guarantee. That's a tough nut to crack every time, all the time. You know, I was. Uh, it's funny as you were as you were saying that I was thinking about well, how do you market this stuff? I mean, in the in the real world of television, uh, a television program is created. The promotion and marketing people come in and sit down in the best of all possible worlds. Vince Manzi out there was the president of the NBC agency at a time when they created marketing and promotion for their television shows. So during that period of time when Must See TV was happening, all those great shows, whether they were Seinfeld or ER or uh, you know, Cheers, all those shows, they had promos that were done for them. And you talk about in the news business, you know, you'd promote nightly news in the Today Show and Nightline and things like that. How do you promote a VR a news VR product, how do you promote that in, a, in an effective way when the end product is VR, it's not 2D? Uh, do you want to talk about that for a second? Yeah, I think for certain events it, it makes sense. Um, and I'll give you one example, and this actually intersects with your question about how to build the business around this as well. Um, in August, you know, obviously we knew that the eclipse was coming and that it was going to be um, a huge event for the country. Is that the piece that you put on the... Yeah, actually, it's on... Right, yeah, it's on the app, as a matter of fact. You can sort of watch a, a, cut, a cut down of it, at least on the app, just a two-minute um, sort of brief summary of the experience. But um, we knew that that, uh, that event was going to be a huge uh, news moment. And one of the great things about something like the eclipse is that it's not breaking news, right? It's happening in real time, but it's something you can easily prepare for. So um, we ended up uh, making probably our biggest bet of the year on that event. And uh, there were, I saw a couple of live streams in 360 of the Eclipse, um, but we live streamed the Eclipse from seven different locations across the entire path of totality. And this operation was, when, when, we, when we sort of netted out what we were gonna do, um, it was such a huge, huge production. It was um, 40 satellite feeds coming into um, a control room in New Jersey that we had to build. Um, just for comparison's sake, for election night, we only used 28. So, so this was a VR control room? This was a VR control room. And we used traditional satellite uh, feeds to um, basically transmit individual cameras in the field and then stitch them at the control room site. And so it required 40 different feeds going up from seven different locations. And many of them were remote, you know, like in Montana and all these like sort of, you know, places where there's no internet connectivity. So it really right. required a satellite. Um, a satellite feed. Um, and we put this together and we're like, wow, this is a massive, massive production. It's, it's going to cost a lot of money. Um, and we managed to get a sponsor on board to help us with it. So Volvo ended up coming in um, and uh, basically sponsoring the Eclipse across television and across uh, VR for CNN. And that also led, so there, there's the commercial part of it, right? Like if you make a few big bets, that's enough to keep our VR operation going for, for a couple more years to go. Um, 
And on the television side, it was a perfect opportunity. We were covering the eclipse on television as it was happening, right? It was two and a half hours or you know, whatever it was. And they were consistently pushing to the VR experience. And we ended up with 5.7 million views in the live experience, which you know, I, I, by my tally is the no, most. The live experience was a 360 experience, yes. but not a VR experience. So. It was a VR, I mean, it was 360 I mean, video in it. VR, yeah. as I had said. It wasn't a VR experience. But I mean, to be able to be there at the site of the eclipse, not, not just in one place, but in seven different places across the country, was an amazing immersive moment. I, I think, I thought it was, you know, I was like, wow, this is a good use for, for 360. Um, and it ended up becoming the most watched live 360, I think of, I think of all time. So um, it, it, it satisfied a business need. It helped us learn the promotion of how to do this live. Uh, and, a lot of um, people, yeah, if you, if you were in the United States, actually I was watching it in the UK mm. on my uh, sling box, which is set up in North Carolina. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it struck me that you, you got a tremendous amount of marketing uh, push out of that just by virtue of the fact that, you know, CNN has such a big footprint and, exactly. and people knew it was coming. So that's really important. People need to know that it's coming in order to be, for you guys to make a business out of it. So can I just add to that real quick? So on the Eclipse, Time Magazine, we did it, one location, no sponsor. <laughs> also about six million views i mean across there facebook and, and and youtube so that speaks to the promotion like the marketing muscle of a cnn is able to go and sort of get volvo yeah. involved time magazine yes we all know it it's big and famous but it does not have that push capability but they got out what they still got out they got it out they couldn't monetize that that six million views that came in or whatever it was five and a half million that's the, you know, that's smart, the smart sales guy will take that number and then now. look at it in the future and say, well, let's, right. let's figure out how we monetize right. this. Well, uh, there's just one other point I think yeah. that's important when in bringing in sponsors is um, the, you know, the story of making that is very interesting. And we've found a lot of just the making ofs of how this stuff is done and, you know, sponsors just wanting to be associated with right. innovation. Yeah. Uh, and it's right now it's oftentimes the story of how it got made is, uh, can be more interesting than the piece itself. Not to say that that's the case, you but know, I, it's... I, I, speaking as a former director or producer, I agree with you 100%. <laughs> um, so I, I want to talk to Erica a little bit about what it's like to be an entrepreneur in this space today. So, you know, uh, you're, you're, you are the, the sort of the purest link with a startup in the VR space right now and on this panel. Tell me a little bit about the challenges uh, that you face as a VR entrepreneur today? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, some of the challenges really are that we're, we're building systems and companies based on assumptions of hardware, uh, available browsers, available softwares. Sometimes, um, you know, like just this week, I think it was announced the Nokia Ozo is gone. So anybody who invested in that $60,000 asset is gone. So for a startup, that's, that's a huge blow. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of the startups who are tackling it uh, in a really smart manner are actually leveraging the power of the collective. I think with virtual reality more so than any other industry, it's a, it's a team of people who are willing to collaborate with each other. And so, so, hold on, I, I want to ask you about that because yeah. it sounds like the Borg to me. Um, the Borg, anybody get that reference? Mm -hmm. I, thank you, Stacey. A couple of, couple of people here got the reference. Um, what is the collective? I'm sorry, what was that? What is the collective? Uh, you know, I think there's uh, the collective of just the number of individuals who are interested in seeing the metaverse, right? So you have people who go all the way to the extreme of, you know, let's completely recreate reality um, to people who are interested in pushing new hardware, people who are push interested in pushing new software and new technologies. Um, and everybody is collaborating and having conversations together on their best practices, on the technologies. And more often than not, when I say the collective, what I mean is that it is, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a producer at a collective called Making 360. And the number of us that are part of this collective, we're, we're producing VR pieces all over the world with a number across different industries. Um, but we all also work in different companies as well. So simply because you're working at Jaunt or if you're working at Within or you're working at a number of other organizations, most likely on your off time because you want to innovate and because you want to explore what you're, what's possible, um, we're all coming together to push those boundaries together. 
Can I ask about, um, I, we talked about the challenges of being in the space. Talk about, and I ask each of you this, talk about the things that, that really turn you on in this space right now. What, what, is the, what, is the, what is the thing that gets your juices flowing the most? Yeah, for me, I think about this space is the fact that I, I believe we all know, although sometimes choose not to acknowledge the fact that we are all our own media companies. Uh, the thing that draws us to social media, that draws us to the internet, uh, to pretty much draws us back to our technology is the fact that we can make our presence known because we are our own production companies. Um, you know, so for me, being able to empower people with the effective influence of virtual reality and turning them into Sherpas, I can invite you into the experience of my life with uh, a 360 camera, whether that's in sunny days, running around having fun at the Oregon Eclipse, or if that is responding to floods and disasters, and because it's my personal experience, um, it's, it is a bit more unfiltered. And I think the idea that we can try and control the story is, um, is trying to hold on to an anchor of a, of a time that we are rapidly leaving behind. So you, you can't really affect the story you really don't edit VR, right? You you effectively put images together, but you don't cut from a wide shot to a tight shot to a medium shot. You don't really. How how do you how do you get from change time and place, for example? What is what is the quickest way, the best way, the easiest way, and the way that looks the most organic to change time and place in VR? Well, I, would, I mean, I do think you edit. VR, um, and I think it's a matter of um, maybe it's not, you're changing architectures and landscapes and proximities to, to characters. Um, the, you know, you have a whole lot of tools to create variance and, and subjectivity with across your shots. It's just not the, the ones you're maybe most familiar with. So um, what is the key differentiator to make a, uh, from a director's perspective that makes you look at what it is you, the director, wants them to look at? Or do you even have that as an issue? Well, I think, as you mentioned, you're sound. You're your head down there one way, and you're, <laughs> oh, but I think let's, let, let, go ahead, first of all, uh, Patrick. You, sound is like the first thing people think of. You know, directional <laughs> audio, you have spatial audio, and you can create cues to cause people to look around. I think um, something that, you know, in the early days it was, oh, don't move the camera, but actually movement can be very powerful. And, you know, when you have a direction to movement, I think that, you know, kind of ask people to look forward, but also you, you give them a lot more variety over the course of a shot to kind of soak in different aspects of things. Um, and, you know, and then, uh, you know, depending on the level of control you have of the scenario, you can use things like lighting and blocking to kind of help with that. If you have a newscaster, they can, well, you know, we've done a number of things yeah, with ABC you're not, News. You're not gonna go into um, the aftermath of Charlottesville and light and block it. Uh, no. I, I still, I mean, I think that, um, I, I agree with you, I do think that VR needs to be edited. And I do think that even though you don't do shot sequencing in a traditional way, you do want to focus the attention of your viewer. I don't think it's the goal of 360 to have them sort of whipping around trying to find something interesting to look at. I think um, the 360 is what gives them the feeling of being there. But then you, you still need to have some sort of centralized action in your frame. That, uh, that they are discovering either by looking around or, as you said, using audio um, or some other sort of cue that often helps them to find the part of the scene that requires their attention. Just like in real life, I mean, just because I can see behind me doesn't mean that I'm looking behind me at the moment. Um, so it, it's a matter of, of trying to keep an interesting part of the frame consistent throughout the experience, I think. Um, well, and I think it's the good point of you, the one thing you don't want is so the first thing people always shoot in 360 is stuff going on in every direction. Yeah. And really you want to create like a choreography through your editorial that the person has a comfortable experience of maybe they have one rotation across 20 shots, but they're slowly led through that. Or, you know, I think creating a, that comfortable experience is also important to just getting people into it and, and understanding. I was just going to say, so I, A, I think VR definitely needs to be, or 360 does need to be edited. It's storytelling is still storytelling, so shot to shot to shot in some narratively driven sequence. But there are, you know, all sorts of tricks in the post-production side of it where you can put little creeps and crawls and moves on the video without the, 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 the user or the audience member touching the screen or looking around. So we, we took an approach for USA Today 
where we did a we put three cameras on one of the America's Cup boats and is the Oracle team as it got ready to defend for this year's and America's that's Cup. the video that's on the, that's on there on the uh, and we we talk in terms of 12 o'clock so the in the post the first shot you see yes we we might have made that editorial decision and if we put a creep on it to sort of hint to look over there or whatever then fine but the idea that that, a, that somebody can look at that piece of video and not touch the screen that 12 o'clock to 12 o'clock to 12 o'clock still was as compelling as if it were a piece of 2D video, that was important to us. Yeah. And it was in the, through the discovery process, so you're focused on to, you know, the, the action. Um, we were not afraid of putting cameras on people, right. on the skipper, so that you're, you are moving through a space. It might be frenetic and crazy, but you're there. Um, and you know, you're on a moving vehicle. So it was a combination of fix. You know, I didn't find that to be a problem when I was looking at right. it. I actually thought it was spectacularly so, done. So the idea, so we just, we backed up a second on our, on our just go back to old fashioned storytelling and production techniques, took that out with various 360 cameras, cut it together as if we were telling a story. And when you look at it, you're, it's, you end up going back to looking at it again and again, because, oh, by the way, I can look at the top of this, or I can look what's happening off the back of the boat or whatever. So loosening up the, the kind of constraints of what we think VR might s strap us with and just sort of say, hey, let's just tell stories. Let's just cut a piece of video. Let's just put it out there and see what happens. That was that sort of where we're coming from to a certain degree. So um, Eric, I'm gonna give you the final word on the panel uh, before we go out and ask uh, the audience. And thank you all for staying. It's like, great, because most everybody stayed. I, I guess we were speaking some pretty good stuff. Erica, last word. Yeah, I think that um you know, as we're, as we're thinking about the exploration of storytelling in virtual reality, we're thinking about unscripted, uh, you know, specifically on this panel, I think it's important to keep in mind that we're, we're really, what we're looking at is experiential, right? The, the kind of embodied cognition, the kind of information that's coming across by 360 is, is not only the story. You can develop story with a voiceover narrative, with different indicators. I, I when I'm, putting together a piece, I like to think of it more like walking through a museum uh, where you have a path that you can follow with lots of things to look at, but where an audience member chooses to look is completely up to them. Um, so just keeping in mind a lot of the, the ethics, the production, the story, this unscripted experience of being in an environment and what that means for an individual um, and how they get to be part of that and making them part of that story. I think that's a great place to, to leave the panel discussion. So really terrific uh, talking with all of you. Thank you very much. So Jason Farkas, Patrick Negan, Michael Santiago, Michael Dutton, and Erica. So uh, questions? Yes. So what we're, what we're working on still in development, but it's really leveraging the power of the blockchain, if you're familiar with how that technology works. Not really, but I'll go. Boy, so, you, when you, you said blockchain, immediately the room went, uh. Yeah, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it feels as heavy as a chain, right? The, uh, <laughs> the thing about it is think about it as a ledger, right? So when, when a transaction happens in your checkbook, it's there and, and you recognize it. And so when content is uploaded, there's a lot of metadata on a digital asset. There's location, there's um, the original file descriptions, all these things. And that gets immediately locked into that ledger. And then what happens with blockchain is the ledger will redistribute it into, a, uh, into the entire chain so that only if you have a verification code can you actually pull all that information back together. So if people are making adjustments to it, you can see the number of times that digital asset has been changed because it's different from the original. And this is important mainly because like Eve Google about a month ago revealed that they've figured out uh, a visualization software algorithm where they can completely remove watermarks off of digital images. So those are no longer safe if that's all you're using to lock down your digital images in your stock galleries. So I, blockchain, um, I wrote this down, 
The blockchain is directly proportionate to the collective. Yes. I love that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Next question. Come on. Yes. Uh, so I'm working on a 360 series where I am putting cameras in the hands of young people. I have found some technical resources. I found very few ethical resources as I prepare them. So I've been giving out all of my 360 cameras to disaster responders to see how they act. And then we're now putting together what's going to go into these solar backpacks. Do you have any reference points for giving young people ethical guides to get into these Go to school. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know I, I'm like a member of some Facebook groups. I mean, that's the only thing I can think of offhand, but I, I have to like go look at which ones they are, but it's, it is a conversation that I think goes on consistently in this space. Yeah. So, uh, not, and not just simply in news and documentary, it's, you know, it's porn and video games versus, you know, versus storytelling and meaningful experiences. Well, well, I mean, there's, so. there was so much that we could have discussed here though about non-scripted. We could have talked sports, we could have talked music, we could have talked live versus uh, recorded. So, I mean, this is such a huge conversation to have. But certainly out here in Los Angeles and in New York, um, there are places where, where kids are being taught how to do it. Um, there's a school in uh, uh, Sherman Oaks, a uh, high school in Sherman Oaks, that, that's uh, spending a lot of time teaching that. We and teach it in Oakland, but teaching it in Dominican Republic or Mexico or Peru is a whole different situation when we're dealing with cow farmers, we're dealing with young people who work in fields. And they have ah, that's a different story. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Evo, um, so I did a project in Rio de Janeiro last year um, during the Olympics, and we're, we were working in an innovation hub in the heart of the favelas. Uh, and we, we ran a number of workshops uh, teaching them how to film and shoot in 360 and some of the considerations. Um, the ethical conversation is it's a bit difficult just because of the kind of environments that these kids are growing up in. Their judgment of what is ethical is already in question, unfortunately. But one of the tactics that we found was actually putting them out there, having them produce a piece, and then that same afternoon putting their peers to, to see it, right? And letting them see like, okay, if you decided you wanted to twirl around in a circle holding onto the 360 camera and you thought that was a good idea, this is what it did to your friend and how dizzy they get. And all of a sudden, okay, now you feel bad because their friend didn't want to even see it or look at it. So that kind of direct immediate feedback loop um, was, you know, but, but again, I think it comes more down to the root. If you're using personal judgment, where is the baseline of that beginning? And that, that's really the challenge I've found out in the field. Yes, sir. I mean, I know, John, we do a lot of QC, but it was definitely trial by fire, and, uh, you know, we're streaming, uh, so compression rates, I mean, we're just at the bleeding edge of, or do we do H.265 or H.264, you know, and so from compression all the way through, um, it's become a necessity to have internal. I would assume a lot of folks are, you know, just, because you do realize, oh, this looks different on this screen versus this screen versus this, there's no standards to this to this right that, now. That's got to be... It's, it's brutal. It, that's got to be the biggest <laughs> issue when it comes to uh, QC in and, and the digital world anyway, is the number of mm -hmm. different types of devices that end up. You know, look, just because it ends up on a screen doesn't mean that it's the same, uh, uh, the same content that goes to that screen is going to every other screen. And I think, interestingly enough, I heard one panelist yesterday talking about um, uh, holographic IR VR. So... That's something that might take us to a new level. So VR without goggles. Do okay. you think that's a realistic possibility? Have you heard about that? What are you thinking about uh, that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, VR has got a long road ahead. I do think it's an inevitable kind of part of our digital landscape. But um, I know when I was, I was in grad school with a lot of the 
NASA VR guy. So this was like when the wave started starting up again, talking to those guys. It's like, well, we've seen this before. We'll see when it. But you know, the contact lens stuff. I know that who knows what Magic Leap's doing, but they're supposed to be projecting into your eyes. Mm. Um, I'm wondering if they know what they're doing. <laughs> I'm sure they do. If anyone invest in Magic Leap in the room? Uh, <laughs> Well, and another consideration to your QC question is, is another difficult thing is, is from a business to business standpoint, uh, what are the quality control metrics? Uh, they, they differ from each of our clients. So for example, we work with HSBC Bank who is sponsoring the Open Golf Tournament in, in the UK, and they wanted to film Onrek Stenson um, walking up to a child who was watching a video, a 360 video that we produced in a headset and then surprise them. So the original video that we had, they were just focused on Facebook metrics. They wanted to see, that's how we judge the value and the success of this deal is how many views is this gonna get on a 360 video on Facebook. And for us, we were able to achieve a good amount of combining as the original experience of filming him in the UK, talking about you know, playing in this tournament and then having him walk up and having a separate video um, where he walks up and surprises the child. The child's like amazed that he's sitting right in front of him after and, you know, he talks to him about VR. Um, that's totally different than um, when we were working with the Denver Broncos and they said the file has to be a certain size because we know the metrics of how long someone will be willing to wait for a download. So now the QC process is completely different and now we're managing file sizes, but we couldn't have one metric and say the file size has to be this and it can only be this length based on the length of the video. Nothing is ever that yeah, easy. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's very, uh, it flows from experience to experience, so that's why I think it's hard to have those kind of straight protocols that everyone can kind of sit through. And now you have a QC manager who's got a set of metrics that you can go, okay, here's how we manage the quality of the video. It's just so different for each I mean, we do 37 different transcode varieties on any given file, and, and that's still not enough. You probably need about like 80 varietals of transcodes. It's, yeah. Well, I can't think of a way to end this than to be talking about the varietals of the transcode. Uh, but I, I just want to thank everybody on the panel because it was fascinating. We could have talked about this for another six hours. Thank you all for coming. Really appreciate it. Take your, uh, take your uh, uh, Google Cardboard home. Go download the, uh, the app. Take a look at the stuff on Jaunt. Take a look at CNN stuff. Uh, mesmerize. Uh, some really, really great stuff. Laduma, thank everybody. See you later. Thank you.